know a lot of the folks in this room are deeply committed to racial justice work, the long haul struggle, and that we're trying to figure out now how do we move in a way that actually builds the long term work with the incredible amount of attention that wasn't there even a month ago on white supremacy in the US in general. But how do we deal with the, the threat of these particular, you know, overt violent hate groups? in a way that helps people really look at structural institutional racism, what the long haul work around really building power in oppressed communities looks like, but that really helps people see where those connections are and doesn't have to take the, the um, intense focus that we need right now on these non-state actors, doesn't have to minimize that, but also really helps people who aren't looking at what's the relationship that they have with the state, how we get that back in the picture. And similarly, you know, I've been involved in anti-war organizing pretty consistently since 1999. Like that's the generation that I am, I am of is being activated around the NATO bombing of Kosovo. And we're in this moment where I've never seen so much mainstream attention around US militarism, even acknowledgement around militarism, and so much of it is domestically focused, that we have the incredible uh, advances and powerful growth of the focus, particularly on policing, prisons, anti-prison industrial complex work, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around what, and you're going to help us with this, what is going on in this moment that we have so little coherence around organizing against U.S. empire overseas. Like, what is happening with that? So I think that the, the questions we're struggling with around how to best move with, with what's happening in this moment that Charlottesville is really exposing are very related to the questions that bring us in this room tonight around how do we really rebuild, reignite an internationalist movement where all of our work that may be very focused in our communities, may be focused domestically, is fully integrated into that work against U.S. empire abroad and how these things really need to be reinforcing, it, reinforcing and strengthening each other. So the folks who are going to be speaking tonight are going to help us with that. They are going to be dropping some knowledge to help us learn together and just really look at these questions about how do we fill out the wide expanse between people being outraged about the Klan and Trump's tweets but the vast expanse in between. Like how do we start to weave those threads around challenging white supremacy and militarism in, in all its forms? And there's so much more to say than they're gonna be able to pack into one night, but this one step in an ongoing conversation. And I wanna introduce the fabulous speakers who are gonna be helping us get into, into the study together. Um, so next to me is Max Elbaum. And what he wanted me to say tonight was that he went to his first protest against war and racism more than 50 years ago and has been grappling with how to fight them ever since. And apparently that's all you wanted me to say. <laughs> <laughs> also, just to add, among the many things that Max is one of the co-founders of, of the War Times Project, mm -hmm. author of Revolution in the Air, and also has, has been a absolutely primary and profound mentor to so many folks in my generation and the generation coming up after me who are involved in economic, racial justice, and, and anti-war work in this country, and has been just a huge resource in this movement. So, sorry for <laughs> trying to be all humble and all that. <laughs> um, and then we're going to have on the Skype here, we're going to have Yusuf Baker joining us from um, Long Beach tonight. He's an assistant professor in the International Studies Program at Cal State, and he's a member of the Iraqi Transnational Collective. He spent the last decade studying the American invasion and occupation of Iraq and its continued impact, and he's working on a project to document the stories and experiences of Iraqi migrants, refugees, and exiles uh, across North America. And then we also have Rhonda, Rhonda Ramiro, who has been active in the movement for national democracy in the Philippines since the 1990s. She's a founder of Bayan USA in 2004-2005, facilitating the establishment of the first overseas chapter of the Philippines-based student. Help me correct my pronunciation if I get this wrong, please. 
Bagong Alia Alia sang Makabayan. Which is the new Patriotic Alliance. Um, Bayan for short. And that is a nationwide multi sectoral alliance of over a thousand grassroots groups and people's organizations with a total number of <laughs> over a million people um, fighting for national and social liberation of the Philippines. And Rhonda served as the, gen- the Secretary General of Bayon USA for three years from 2009 and is currently serving her second term as the Vice Chair. So, I want to give our speakers a warm welcome. that we're dealing with that since the high point of the movement specifically against the Iraq war, that it's proven really difficult in this country to build a lasting anti-war movement um, against U.S. interventions in militarism, even though that has been continuing and expanding during, during this past decade plus. So some of this might be because activists have been deeply focused on what we call domestic issues. There's a lot of false binaries around domestic international. Mm-hmm. That's some of what we'll be getting into tonight. And also about how confusing things feel, even for those of us who are really trying to pay attention, stay connected, figure out how to orient. So, and we're in a different mo- moment in this generation in terms of how we're relating to resistance forces, liberation forces in the countries that the U.S. is occupying. Um, different moments from the days when really powerful anti-imperialist movements were sweeping the globe and helping lead the, the left on the U.S. Mm-hmm. So, can you talk with us about some of the complexities <coughs> of the current moment um, and what it might take to rebuild movements here against the in the U.S.? I <coughs> <Any> question. <coughs> I'm going to start with some general ideas that I Respect everyone in this room today. We're internationalists. We're opposed to the exploitation of workers in all countries of the world, and we're opposed to any people oppressing another people. And that's why on our banners, workers of the world unite, workers and oppressed people unite. We're also against militarism and war for two sets of reasons. First of all, war is tremendously destructive, and the people who suffer the most are always the most vulnerable. The poor, women, children, the elderly. And militarism (coughs) breeds a mentality of repression, hierarchy, and all kinds of negativity. Uh, Also, another reason is because we're the majority. And the more struggles for liberation are on the most nonviolent plane possible, the better it is for our side. Now, for most of us, that hasn't translated into complete pacifism. There are times when a revolutionary state or a revolutionary movement has to resort to arms as a last resort. But our general stance is against violence, against war, and trying to have the most peaceful process possible. Those sentiments are only a start, though. The challenge is how to make them a strong material force on the ground. And to do that, we have to look at the concrete conditions, the balance of forces, the consciousness of masses of people in the historical period that we're in. And it's a big challenge, and as everybody knows, it's created a lot of difficulties and a lot of disagreements within the left. The charge I was given this evening is to open up this, not just this evening, but the whole war and liberation series by putting out some ideas about the shape of today's world and what does it mean about building strong movements for peace and against militarism. I'm going to approach that by talking about the difference between the world today and the world of the Cold War. Uh, I think that's an important way to angle into it because even though this world today is so different from the Cold War world, most of the paradigms that we use on the left are carryovers from that period. Those of us who are in my generation were imprinted with those in our formative years and lived with them for many years. 
but they also are tremendously influential for the next generations coming up. And that's reinforced by the fact that there are many continuities between the Cold War period and the current period. For example, the U.S. is still the world's most powerful imperial power intervening all over the world. And many of the struggles that go back to the Cold War period or even before are the ones that inspire us in a positive way. The Cuban Revolution, the Palestinian struggle, and so on. Also, as we've seen the last few days and all of us are trying to cope with, another continuity from the Cold War period is that matters of imperial warmongering and white supremacist violence always come to the forefront at moments when the class struggle is very intense. So I'm going to try to give a brief picture of the Cold War world, how it was seen by most revolutionaries, and then talk about the change to this current period. There were many differences of opinion on the left, but almost all the frameworks that existed saw the Cold War world as one of steady progress toward revolutionary change. There were countries that had broken away from the imperialist system. Many of us considered them socialists. There were surging movements for national independence and national liberation in what was then called the Third World, and today we usually refer to as the Global South. There were workers' movements and other radical progressive movements in the imperialist continent. And what was true in that period was virtually all of those movements were led by one or another variety of communist, socialist, or radical leftists. Of course, there were strains and conflicts within that, within the left-led movement, but in general, they were aligned in what most of the left called the world revolutionary process, the global united front against U.S. imperialism, formulations like that. The left was the main force in the world opposed to imperialism, not just practically on the ground, but ideologically. By and large, that world was characterized by an ideological polarization between capitalist ideology, which presented itself as free enterprise and democracy, and socialist ideology. And the other outlooks that existed to try to explain the world were pushed to the margin. In the years 19, you know, the main character of wars during that period were counter-revolutionary wars fought by the empire against progressive national liberation and independence movements, and also the constant threat of nuclear war with the countries that had broken away from the imperial system. In that context, there was a very close connection between movements for peace and solidarity with liberation struggles. It put the left that was in solidarity at the core, like Claire was referring to, at the core of much broader struggles for peace, and they were in sync with one another. After 1989 to 1991, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, the San Diego defeat in the elections, and most of all, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, that world came to an end. Most uh, left, the most prestigious left history of the 20th century era, Hobsbawm's book, The Age of Extremes, which is on that resource list that I prepared, says there's no doubt that one historical era ended and another historical era began in the 1989-1990 period. Now, in retrospect, it's a good thing that the Cold War ended. It did allow, the Cold War period did allow for some revolutionary progress, but in many ways it was a straitjacket on moving toward global human freedom. So it's not a bad thing that the Cold War was over. But the problem is the terms on which it ended were very unfavorable to the world's working class and oppressed people. Now, I'm convinced that we're going to overcome the setbacks. But the first, in order to do that, we have to take a hard-headed and realistic inventory of what 
change and where we are. First off, the most negative part from that period has continued, which is U.S. imperialism intervening, stationing bases all around the world, CIA interventions. I don't think I have to go into that detail with the people in this room. In the side against the empire, some of the left-led struggles continue. And, you know, other Rhonda will talk about that in the Philippines, and there are others that have continued that we're in solidarity with. But if we look at those three sectors of the globe, we see some of the serious setbacks. So the Soviet Union, even with all its structural problems, was generally on the side of the national liberation movements around the world and was a check on the U.S. Empire. Mm -hmm. To read anything by the Vietnamese from the, from the 1950s through the 1980s, and it will talk about the Soviet role in supporting the Vietnamese struggle. The Soviet Union is no more. Russia is run by an oligarchy that hosts gatherings of right-wing movements from across the globe whose position is that Russia will be the savior of white Christian civilization while all the other European countries get diluted by Muslim immigration. <coughs> Putin's strong rhetoric is seen as a model and the Islamophobia that's propagated uh, by the uh, Russian government in alliance with the Christian church in Russia is as severe as the Islamophobia in the United States. In the global south, there's no longer the kind of solid alliance of national liberation movements and progressive governments against the empire that existed at the time. It's most stark by looking at three countries which were pillars of the non-aligned movement formed at the Van Dyne Conference in 1955, which gave rise to the non-aligned movement, which was pretty much every country in the world that wasn't a developed capitalist country or the Soviet bloc and was a force against empire at the United Nations and on the ground for 40 years. So three of the key countries, India at the time was led and represented at Van Dung by Nehru, who was an anti-colonial revolutionary, considered himself a socialist, an advocate of nuclear disarmament and general disarmament. Today, India is led by a Hindu nationalist party that's propagating Islamophobic violence, threatening nuclear war, and closing up the Israel. Another pillar of the non-line movement was Egypt, at the time led by Nasser, who advocated pan-Arab unity against Zionism and imperialism and he was considered the most dangerous leader in the world by the Saudi reactionary monarchy. Today, Egypt is a military dictatorship whose main backers are the Saudi monarchy and the U.S. imperialism. The third country, Yugoslavia, was led by a dissident communist, Tito, who tried a different model of socialism than the Soviet Union, Today, Yugoslavia doesn't exist. Two seven small countries broken up, and in several of them, openly fascist forces are the dominant political tendency. Across the Middle East and Africa, communists and leftists were murdered in large numbers through the Cold War period. Think Amilcar Cabral, assassinated by the Portuguese. Patrice Lumumba, assassinated by uh, agents of the West, and various reactionary movements based on sectarian theocratic principles, ethnic chauvinism, or various forms of narrow nationalism have moved from the margins to the center. They're opposed to imperial domination, but their programs are socially reactionary, and the tactics of terrorism are not nothing like this approach to armed struggle by the national liberation movements that brought people And in the imperial heartlands, we have a rise of right-wing racist populism. Donald Trump is the version right here. I think Bill Fletcher captured that, essentially. Uh, it's the politics of racial and imperial revenge. So wars 
and interventions have become much more complicated. Of course, there are still common revolutionary wars fought against progressive national liberation movements. But there's also all kinds of times where the U.S. fight is intervening against the government that itself has been massacring the left. There's ethnic conflicts, religious conflicts, and intercapitalist conflicts where none of the players are opposed to imperialism with the progressive agenda. That's made everything much more complicated. Those are the kind of challenges that the peace movement faces. So we face issues about how do we oppose U.S. intervention without either demonizing or criticizing other forces around the world. What does solidarity look like when we're dealing with situations where there's no left party with a large mass base that can be our counterpart? How do we get the moral high ground against intervention? Uh, in situations where it seems to be a fight among bad guys as opposed to good guy versus bad guy situation? How do we link movements against war and against racism together? And how do we get organizations that are focused on domestic issues to integrate anti-war into that programs, realizing that we'll never make progress if we're vulnerable to the national security state you know, get behind the president, you have to go to war and national security. Um, i got to wrap up now. The resource list that I, I prepared gives some ideas for that. I think there's a lot of approaches that go in the direction of stressing that war solves no problems. It makes every existing problem worse. Resources that go to militarism need to be used to tackle human needs. In a world threatened by climate change, negotiations and diplomacy are the only way to solve problems. That latter in particular, if we look at the millions of people who are opposed to U.S. threats against North Korea right now, that kind of approach has galvanized governments and peoples all over the world against the idea of going to war to solve this problem. It's too dangerous in the modern world. That's what we have to work with, and there's tremendous potential there if we look the challenges in the face and take a long haul approach figuring out how to tackle. Given the nuclear saber rattling uh, with Korea and the, the threats made against people on Guam on the colonized island of Guam, um, and all the domestic scandals that happen are getting manufactured in order to distract people's attention, um, we we want some help in really trying to think through what has been announced as the declaration of victory over Daesh, the Islamic State in Iraq, um, what has been put out as the fall of Mosul. At the same time that we have U.S. generals talking openly about the loosening of the rules of engagement and the, the increase of really indiscriminate killing. Um, just help us, help us think through how we should understand this moment in relationship to the last 14 years of U.S. military engagement in Iraq in the context also of the, the 16 years long occupation of Afghanistan and the other engagements and interventions in the region, um, what is most important for us to understand about war and then also about resistance struggles and how people are are fighting back in the region? Can you hear us okay? I should ask that first. Yeah, no, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you, you all can hear me. Can you hear us yeah. back? Yeah, you're good. Okay, perfect. So, uh, first, let me just quickly thank the center, uh, and specifically Isaac and Rachel for putting on the panel uh, and the series in general. And thank you all, all the folks that I can't see, for for being there and for putting up with me being there virtually. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with everybody and all the points that 
Max just brought up, or there's a lot to think about. So I really appreciate the opportunity to think through out loud with you all. Um, so I'm going to answer maybe the question. I'm going to put out a lot of different points, uh, just throw them out, and then maybe we could kind of dive into them more uh, as, as we kind of move on or if there's interest in it. So what I want to rather do is kind of provide some kind of framework to think through the, the, the question that you just posed. Uh, and I want to answer that by using maybe four different levels of analysis. That's more, that's levels of analysis, both temporally and spatially to, to, to think through this. So I want to, I'm going to move from talking about zooming in all the, all the way to Mosul and the, 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 the recapture of Mosul to then zoom out to talk about ISIS or Daesh uh, in a regional faction and the emergence of them, to then talking about the role of the United States and then ending with a few points on empire, liberalism, and white supremacy. So that's kind of what I wanna, what I wanna do. So I'm gonna start with talking about the fall of Mosul. Uh, you know, on July 10th, so just recently, Haider Abadi, the prime minister of Iraq, declared victory in Mosul. But the declaration of victory, as they often do, they, hi they hide behind them the devastation that, that then must be confronted after the declarations. In this case, there are four major questions that are yet to be answered following the battle over Mosul. The first is the question of reconstruction, development, and the internally displaced. The Mosul is a major city in Iraq and has historically been a commercial hub in the region, dating back to the Ottoman Empire and even before that. It is also a very diverse city, which itself is a testament to its commercial uh, importance throughout, throughout history. That is all gone now. Uh, the battle to retake Mosul also destroyed Mosul. There, it, it leveled the city itself. So there is a question of counterinsurgency that we could think about and in comparison between what is happening, what Assad is doing, what the United States is doing, what the Iraqi government is doing. We could, that, that, is a question, that, that is a conversation we can have. The question though is, how will Mosul be reconstructed? How will it be revived to at least be inhabitable or to be worthy of human life? What will happen to more than half of the population? Estimated by the United, the United Nations, the estimate was over one million people who were displaced and became refugees because of the specific battle just in Mosul. And what does that mean in terms of the lasting affective consequence of trauma that is, going, that is held by all of the population and how will that get passed on and what does that mean for the future of the people that inhabit that place? So far, previous reconstruction efforts in other cities recaptured after ISIS, such as Ramadi and Fallujah, do not show a bright future. The second question is, popular the, the, a question around popular mobilization units or the paramilitary units that were created by different political factions in Iraq to fight ISIS. Popular mobilization units are paramilitary units created by different political factions to fight uh, when the Iraq's, Iraqi military capacity had been undermined. These forces are loyal to their political factions and not necessarily to the central government. So then the question then is, what will be the relationship between the Iraqi military and police on the one hand and these forces on the other hand? Will political groups with, within Iraq relinquish control over arms and militias? The third question is a political battle between the central government of Iraq and the Kurdish regional government. One of the strongest, if not the strongest, fighting forces in Iraq is the Peshmerga forces, which are the military units of the Kurdish regional government. This, the, 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 this government, the, uh, the Kurdish regional government's conflict with the central Iraqi government in Baghdad has only escalated, especially with the emergence of ISIS on the one hand and the economic downturn in Iraq due to the slump in oil prices. The fight against ISIS has further empowered the Peshmerga and the KRG is holding a referendum on independence from Iraq it's September 25th, which will only exacerbate the divisions and tensions with, uh, with, within Iraq and also the region itself. And fourth, how 
to us the, how do you rebuild a state in Iraq that is competent and can unify the country? How and will the Iraqi central government be able to, for the first time in its short life since the invasion of Iraq, uh, uh, be able to be competent? The only way it could do that is to remove the sectarian nature of how its institutions were built and divvied up by the United States occupation. That is a tall challenge since it will mean it has to confront and dismantle the legacy of America's presence in Iraq. So those are the four questions when we look at Mosul itself. So now, if we move beyond that, let's talk about ISIS. Because what I just, what I just said assumes a, a, a victory over ISIS, which is not the case, as, as you mentioned. ISIS is still alive and is functioning in Iraq itself, still having control over large swaths of territory. So in order for us to understand the danger of ISIS, we must zoom out beyond Mosul. In order to do that, we must uh, I want to talk quickly about methodology or how we come to understand groups such as ISIS. So imperialist and colonialist forces always clump up their enemies. There is, that, that is on one hand, a rhetorical strategy involved in, in, in doing that. Uh, be, uh, uh, and, and on the other hand, it's because their enemies are never seen as human beings. They always lack history, materiality, and rationality. So as Edward Said mentions in Orientalism, the, 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 the way that people are clumped up is they are denied the ability to change over time, and they are denied the ability to be different amongst each other. So by denying all those things, then you could clump up groupings of people all, uh, together all the time and you're unable to distinguish between them and thus historicize them uh, and to then truly understand what is happening. So if we try to undo the imperialist or colonialist methodological apparatus, what we must do in order to understand ISIS is to unclump it and to historicize it. So ISIS in Iraq, I would argue, is the coming together of three things. One is the breakaway factions from Al-Qaeda, which infiltrated Iraq after the bombing of Afghanistan in 2001. This was a small force. Second are the rebels in Syria. That is something new after the uh, 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 in the past couple of years. And third is the former Iraqi military personnel who, were, who, who joined the insurgency and later on they, they developed a tactical alliance with these Al-Qaeda fighters. So for example, the top two lieutenants of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi during the takeover of Mosul were, uh, the first one is Abu Ali al-Anbari, who was a major general in the army of Saddam Hussein and hails from Mosul itself, and Abu Muslim al-Turkmani, who was a lieutenant colonel in Saddam Hussein's military intelligence, who was killed in 2015. So that's, those are kind of the groupings that came together that, that, that gave us the term ISIS. These groups, though, came together within a specific context. And those were three things. One was the tremendous disenchantment with the Iraqi government. Two was the mis mismanagement and disenfranchisement of specific elite groups and popular groups during the American occupation itself. And third is the fluid money and intelligence network of Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies who are in a regional war against one, Iran and its, and, and its allies on the one hand, and as well as pro-democratic and leftist social movements on the other. What I'm arguing is that ISIS or groups like it do not come about because of something inherent in the culture of the people that surround them. They do not arise because of religious texts and no study of Quran, Islamic history, or Islamic jurisprudence could help us understand ISIS. Let me say that again, that no, no study of religious texts, Quran, Islamic history, or Islamic jurisprudence could help us in any way, shape, or form understand ISIS, how it came about, or what, what it will do. Groups like it are political movements that emerge out of specific political and economic conditions that have been laid down over the years due to specific historical conditions, some of which I, I believe are the ones that Max laid out. In order to understand ISIS, we have to understand the aftermath of the Gulf War in 1991, the brutal siege laid on Iraq thereafter, and the 2003 invasion of Iraq. 
That is on the one hand. On the other hand, we need to understand the history of counterinsurgency that has been fought by the United States and, an and its allied elites in the Middle East since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. This is a fight that, and a fight against the Third World Project, whose many visionaries and founders were in the Middle East themselves. One of whom was Abdul Karim Qasim, who had a who uh, who was uh, the leader of Iraq for eight years, and who was then assassinated uh, and killed by by Ba'athist counter uh, counter coup uh, 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 that was aided by the CIA itself. The, uh, the, this counterinsurgency is currently taking the shape of a U.S., Egypt, Saudi, Israeli alliance on the one hand, Iraqi, uh, 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 then you have Iran and its allied forces on the other hand, and then you have non-state civilian social forces on, on another. So three different groupings, I would group them. So it should be clear by now uh, in, in what I'm saying that to unclump and historicize ISIS means that we need to understand the consequences of American intervention in Iraq. So now let's zo zoom to the third level, which is the role of the United States. The role of the United States in the misery that pervades Iraq cannot be overstated. Iraq is a damning testament to the failure of the American project throughout the Middle East and the world more generally. The failure of America's ideas of development, democracy, and what have you. The United States is culpable and ought to be held for it to account for the tragedy we see in Iraq. Let me briefly mention four areas of, the, of, of failure uh, for the American project. So uh, I'm going to quickly just list them, and then we can come back to them. The first is a failure of reconstruction, and this has to do with neoliberal development models. The second is a failure of institution building. Uh, and and, and, and uh, we could come. We could talk f further about that. Third is the promotion of sectarianism. I argue that Paul Bremer and the U.S. occupation were one of the most sectarian rulers of Iraq and continued the same sectarian culture of Saddam that they so bemoaned. And lastly, the breaking apart of the country. The cumulative effects of the failure of reconstruction, institution building, and the promotion of sectarianism has meant the breaking apart of Iraq as a country where we are observing one of the first experiences of partition in the 21st century, albeit a very drawn out one. So let me then end with talking quickly about empire, liberalism, and white supremacy. What Iraq was was an experiment it was an experiment where you attempt to prove your ideological position. The problem, though, was that this was an experiment done on an entire country with an entire people. An experiment where if it goes bad, you, relatively speaking, don't have to experience any of the consequences, where the consequences of the experiment gone wrong will be shouldered by those that you experiment on. That's what the United States war makers were doing. Not only does the imperial country not have to suffer the consequences of its actions, it uses the devastation to further bolster its position and legitimate itself as an imperial power with altruistic uh, uh, missions throughout the world. So that the United States has to first get us to forget that it allied with the Ba'athists against the leftists and the left-wing nationalists and allied with Saddam against Iran. It has to get you to forget about that and position itself as a police of world order. And based on that, it wages a war against Iraq in 1991. Then it has to get you to avert your eyes against the devastation it brought on Iraq and how it helped retain Saddam Hussein's power while arguing itself, while arguing that it is itself the prophet of democracy as it invades again in 2003. Now it tells you to avert your eyes again and forget about how it destroyed a country to get you to believe that ISIS is a menace that is organic to the region and thus it has the legitimacy for all the violence it used in the past and the legitimacy for the forces that it will use in the future. Thus liberal empires such as the United States and the British before them tell us not to look at their imperialist and colonialist devastations, but rather focus on the idea that they are the pinnacle of liberalism, of democracy, and of freedom. So even if you go back to Obama, you, he, he excuses everything that happens in Iraq over and over again based on the idea that we had good intentions. We wanted to bring democracy. We wanted to bring liberalism. And so then everything that it does is, is okay. And there is no imperialism in that because 
of, of what it does. Thus, the, they ask us to believe that the United States has a gift called liberalism that is both particular to it and universal at the same time, that it alone has the responsibility and authority to spread it to all those without it. You see, discursively, the way Iraq is talked about is the same way that colonizing First Nations were talked about under Manifest Destiny. So that's, for me, how white supremacy, American nationalism, and America's war on terror are related. Thank you. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot to be taken in, even though it is still just such a tip of the iceberg. What's that? <laughs> you were great. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, I'm just giving it a moment because there's so much to actually take that in and digest it. And it's so important to do that. Um, and because I think Rhonda is going to give us an, an equally, equally important and probably equally heavy piece. Um, so, Okay, so last week we had the situation. Um, we had Rex Tillerson, who I just don't, I don't want to call Secretary of State because I'm still in denial about a lot of his cabinet, um, being in the Philippines for this meeting where he was tying these comments about North Korea together to the ongoing security collaborations um, with different South Asian nations and specifically talking about Daesh and counterinsurgency in the Philippines. Um, how should we be understanding U.S. intervention across that whole spectrum from the security collaborations and training right up to the direct military operations um, in this region of the world? And if you can also talk about how do we understand this as it relates to struggles for national liberation in the Philippines and beyond? Thanks, Claire, and thank you, Matt. Thank you, Seth, for your uh, presentations as well and your provocative. Uh, questions to all of us about the challenges that we're grappling with today. Um, my presentation connects to everything. I'm hoping it ends on the note of the second half of what this whole series is about, which is not the war part, but the resistance part. And um, so, just to give that speech preview, it'll end on the resistance part. So, hopefully, it's kind of a, an upbeat note. <laughs> um, so, this presentation here, thank you, Yusef, for. Um, sharing it on the screen, uh, U.S. military pivot to the Asia Pacific and intervention in the Philippines. So like Claire was saying, Rex Tillerson was just in um, my homeland a couple of weeks ago talking with President Duterte about basically the war on terror, um, same old rhetoric that we've been hearing since uh, 2001, recycled, repurposed for today, um, but the same old thing. Uh, and now it's um, also caught up with this new uh, shift, of so-called shift of the U.S. military um, to the Asia Pacific region. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, uh, as well as um, why, why the Asia Pacific um, and what's at stake there. Who are the people that are there? Not just the interests of uh, U.S. imperialism, but the actual people uh, who care about that region, who live there, for whom it's home and the resistance, yeah. Um, so, um, thank you, Seth. Next slide here. This is not a repo. Um, Seth, next slide. This is actually uh, the Islamic city of Malawi in the Philippines. So, uh, if folks have been following, or maybe not, uh, since May of this year, the uh, government of the Philippines has been basically waging a war on uh, our people in the southern islands of Mindanao, uh, which is considered a stronghold of Muslim extremists, that's what they call them. Um, and this city, which is um, the city in the Philippines with the largest number of people who are considered uh, moral and Islamic in the entire country. Uh, since that time, a city of 400,000 people has become a ghost town. There's 400,000 people who are now refugees because of this war on um, a so-called uh, Islamic State influence or land terrorist group called the Malik Um Should sound familiar to folks in the room as 
maybe not the Philippines uh, case specific, but the same kind of excuse that the, the U.S. has used to go after um, people in other regions um, and to justify intervention in other countries. It's the same here uh, in the Philippines. Now, this is being conducted by the Philippine government itself. Um, but you just have to be, uh, go to the next slide. Um, Rex Tillerson was just in the Philippines and saying, oh, you have a Islamic terrorist problem in your country? We're here to help. We're here to come back and um, spread more support to Philippine government to um, get rid of this problem. Now, it's not new. So he may have just been there a couple of weeks ago, but groups can go back to 2002. So right after, uh, I'm sure folks in this room remember September 11, 2001, um, the Philippines was actually called the second front in the U.S. war on terror. Um, this was the place where they stationed special operations forces on basically a permanent basis to um, secure uh, this region of the world where they considered uh, a new batch of Islamic extremists were going to be coming um, and I don't know what they could call it reading more, giving birth to more uh, in the Southeast Asia region, Indonesia, uh, with supposedly where they were going to be coming from, but then going to the Philippines to then do their training and <coughs> launch operations from there. So it became what was called the second front in the war on terror. Um, so while that uh, started in 2002 with these special operations forces under the guise of fighting the war on terror, um, that relationship has kind of gone through mostly like a solid thing. Philippine president after Philippine president since that time welcomed in the U.S. troops, allowed them in, allowed them to station there. Um, and over the past year, anybody here of um, Rodrigo <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's been in the news because he's Trump, right? So um, he, about a year ago, used to talk really big about taking the U.S. troops out and saying he didn't want the U.S. Uh, military operating in uh, the country anymore, not operating in the South, where the U.S. had uh, caused uh, so many problems for over a hundred years. Uh, but he's really backtracked since then. And now the JJ is actually saying, okay, you know, I won't, I won't put up a fuss if you want to bring your military back in. So uh, Secretary of State and President JJ just met a couple of weeks ago to talk about this. Um, but it's not new. The Philippines has always actually been a priority for U.S. military intervention, as is a lot of places, right? So in this slide, uh, we're talking about, there's a quote, sorry, that's very tiny there, um, from the uh, Special Operations Command um, saying that Special <coughs> Operations Forces are the main effort uh, for the U.S. against violence, violent extremist organizations, um, focused operations in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, across the Sahel of Africa, the Philippines, and Central and South America. So, basically we say anywhere that Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State are to be found. Um, so there's special operations forces across at least 80 countries and 8,000 of them, 50,000 of them all over. Uh, in the Philippines, they were generally stationed around 660 on basically a permanent basis, even though they would call it, oh, no, they're not permanent here. They rotate. They rotate in and out 660 special operations forces and the southern island. Um, and now there's uh, some new plans for possibly another operation, just like they had launched in 2002. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so, but we're going to go back in time a little bit. So this is the past two weeks, but really we could see it as part of uh, a strategy uh, that. Uh, one of the most recent iterations of U.S. military strategy in the region, which is called this uh, Pivot Toward Asia, which was actually announced in 2012 under President Obama. So it's not a new Trump thing, it's a carryover from uh, Obama and actually uh, conceived under the previous uh, administration of, of Bush. So a long time in the making. Uh, this quote, I think, kind of sums it up. The U.S. is a Pacific power, and we are here to stay. And that was actually something that President Obama said. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so what is this uh, Pacific pivot? So it's the Department of Defense plans, uh, military strategy announced in 2012, where they plan to shift more attention, uh, 
being more militant in terms of protecting and expanding interests in the Asia Pacific region. In a minute, I'll blow up this map so you can see it a little bit better. Um, really, I see it as a continuation of the whole U.S. imperialist project that began way back in 1898 uh, when it first went to war with Spain for control of territories and acquired its first colonies in the Pacific. So the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and then later Cuba, Guam, Hawaii, uh, and then actually even continued on into the uh, middle of the last century with wars with Japan and Korea and then into Indochina and Vietnam. So it's not really a new strategy, but it's a new fangled way to talk about U.S. protecting its interest in the region. Um, what does it entail? It, they're talking about deploying 60% of their naval forces into the region, more of a U.S. military presence in the places that are um, on this map, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, even into Thailand. Um, now, these are places where the U.S. has already been, but they're talking about running it even more. And so some of the biggest struggles in the region are against this uh, new pivot for uh, you know, increased militarization in the region. Um, next slide. Here's a, from now. You can see a little bit better, right? So um, at the top there, you know, folks know Okinawa is a, a military base. One island of the, you know, 60% of the island is all U.S. military bases. Um, China's got things <coughs> there in Korea, building a new base on uh, Jeju Island. Uh, in the Philippines, now the bases were actually, the U.S. bases were actually kicked out of the Philippines back in 1991, but they've returned. I'll talk a little bit more about um, the new way that the U.S. has brought back bases, which um, makes it not in violation of the Constitution of the Philippines. Um, Guam remains a stronghold, more troops there, more in Australia, and then even into um, uh, Thailand and some other places where they weren't really a stronghold before. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So then, why? All right. So, I, not any different from oh, 100 and, what, 20 years ago in the 1890s. It was about resources and expansion. Um, it's about, you know, I think this quote <laughs> is kind of, you know, the words out of their own mouth, right? So, U.S. <coughs> economic and security interests inextricably linked to the developments in the arc extending from the Western Pacific and East Asia into the Indian Ocean and South Asia, creating a mix of evolving challenges and opportunities. Accordingly, the U.S. military will continue to contribute to security globally, and we will, of necessity, rebalance toward the Asia Pacific region. So it's, you know, it's not really about um, protecting or helping people in the region. It's about securing interests and um, uh, interests related to U.S. markets, U.S. Uh, Geopolitical so, can we have the, the next slide? So, you know, why? What are some of the, the details on this? So, there's, you know, the region is home to 61% of the population, major markets for U.S. exports, two thirds of U.S. agricultural exports, one direct invest investment for um, uh, $23 billion worth. And then, as we go into like the whole uh, jockeying, with um, China, right, the new rising global external power, um, the Asia Pacific region is key. And you have to have, or the U.S. sees this as uh, essential to secure its interest in being able to control different waterways for um, uh, shipping or uh, different ports for um, the products and so forth. Um, to have that, and have it be there, so they're under their control, or under their, the control of their allies, as they uh, have this uh, conflict with China. Uh, next slide. Okay. So how how do they make it happen? Uh, a lot of different ways. It doesn't look like the old fashioned as, as much as it like the old fashioned uh, colonial occupations of places. Now they just work. Um, go around people or go around different countries' constitutions or encourage their puppet government there to change constitutions <laughs> or reinterpret constitutions. Now, this is happening not only in uh, the Philippines, which is something that I'm most familiar with, but even in places like Japan, where you 
recently had the whole opening up uh, and rearming of the Japanese military, uh, which is supposed to be under a so-called you know, constitution. Right now, you have a uh, rearming of the Japanese military. Uh, in the Philippines, you have um, every administration since 2000 has been trying to push for uh, what they call a charter change, changes in the constitution, which would allow in. Um, they could allow in U.S. military bases. They could allow for 100% foreign ownership of companies, um, you know, operating in the Philippines, all those different kinds of things. Um, so changing the Constitution, you need that friendly government to do that. Uh, and then you have the good old-fashioned new bases or occupying bases of other countries so that you don't stay with the U.S. military base. But um, oh, we're just borrowing it. We're just renting out the space. We're just you know, using it, friends let people do that, right? So, friendly governments that allow their U.S. military to occupy the bases. Um, and then, of course, we see like a lot more um, military exercises, multilateral exercises, joint exercises, um, just like, you know, what they're talking about doing, um, you know, very provocative with officers of North Korea, right? They do that all the time in the Philippines. I think those of us who may be familiar with urban shields, this mm -hmm. area, I know we're mm -hmm. in Oakland, right? Um, think about those war games you know, happening here, or training those first responders and stuff. It happens every year in the Philippines, and you know, imagine a few thousand U.S. troops coming to exercise with your local troops, um, and you know, mock war games coming up on the shore and uh, in communities where people live. You know, it's not like they're in some remote place. You can live there, um, and then other important ones here. So, drones and intelligence outposts and then counterinsurgency operations. This is the last, uh, actually, if I can go two more, uh, so we'll skip that one and we'll skip it and go to this really quickly. So, the enhanced defense cooperation agreement, I think this is a model that they're using in the Philippines, but they're also using in some of the other Asia Pacific regions, uh, where you're talking about Military agreements, again, which are not your traditional, oh, you know, we'll open up a new base there, okay? um, but getting around that by allowing in um, the troops to be able to occupy bases, um, to put up facilities for intelligence gathering, for the storing of weapons, pre-positioning of weapons and drones and so forth, uh, even nuclear weapons. Uh, but getting around constitutions that prevent that uh, by using these new agreements which say, oh, no, these are actually, um, you know, if you go to the Philippine military, we're just, you know, here to show them how to use it. Um, they're here for us when we're doing our joint exercises, but, you know, they're you know, the, the Philippine military. So they, they, it's, you know, kind of insidious. They're speaking that way, but it's not unlike um, they're doing in other countries. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, so I can wrap up. And then this is the last thing I want to. Um, Second to last thing I want to end with counterinsurgency program. Now, this is um, one of the, the main ways that the U.S. has really intervened in the Philippines. Since you know, 1898, really, there's always been resistance to U.S. colonization, U.S. neocolonialism, U.S. imperialism in our country. And with that means there's the, the flip side, the counterinsurgency program. Uh, run by the Philippine government uh, in order to crush that uh, resistance or now. And now what we have is like directly modeled after the U.S. counterinsurgency guide of 2009, um, the counterinsurgency program of the Philippine government to crush any kind of resistance to uh, the U.S. strategy there. Um, something that you said said really um, resounded with me, and that was the lumping together of people, right? Anyone who's in opposition to this. And so while the Philippine government may try to say this is directed at Islamic militants or terrorist organizations, uh, they lump in you know, people who are everyday activists like you and me. They lump in the uh, communist insurgency, the new people's army, which has been waging this struggle since 1968. Uh, and it's, you know, internationally recognized as a legitimate national liberation movement. Uh, they lump in, uh, you know, all of, I mean, all of us. And, you know, uh, with these 
so-called terrorist groups, and with some that are really considered um, bad terrorist organizations. And the government, using this U.S. model, is waging a war on its own people to um, to question the existence What does it look like? It looks like uh, you know the going in and occupying of schools, occupying of uh, communities, uh, intimidation of communities. Of outright murder of leaders, of outright um, you know, uh, imprisonment, detention, torture of uh, activists, um, as well as um, uh, you know, military um, coming in to pretend to be humanitarian projects, so the U.S. Uh, troops coming in to do that. Um, ultimate objective, kind of like during the Vietnam War, win the hearts and minds of people. They no longer want to depend on the resistance. On the legitimate people's movement. Um, Try to trick the people into thinking that the military and the government is going to uh, you know, provide for the building of new houses and schools and so forth. Really, they're there to occupy. They're there to um, take those resources and use them for their own or for the greater the elite in their country or for uh, wealthy, you know, foreign multinationals that fit in with the design of the uh, U.S. country. So that is um, an insurgency. And if we just flip to the last slide, <laughs> uh, further on, we a couple more so we get to the end, get the ties up. The people's resistance, what did your book like? <laughs> so let's try to end with the high point. Um, the national liber- liberation struggle is strong, it moves on, it's young. It's vibrant um, while, you know, it's been going on since 1898, and then we found it in 1968. We talked about the, um, you know, left-led and, you know, communist-led left um, movements. This is one that's still there, and I think it's a shining example for um, those of us, you know, looking to support and be in solidarity with the liberation struggle. Um, there's also, you know, a broad and vibrant people's movement, which is actually very young, too. I've, always um, excited to see that when I go out <laughs> to the homeland and go to the rallies, everybody's like half my age, it's great. Um, and then uh, in solidarity with peoples around the world. So if we just go to the, the last slide, or second to the last slide, see that. there we go. Oh, one more. There we go. Um, part of building an international movement against uh, the U.S. Red War. Uh, I have a you can't see it on this one, but there's a, a new uh, movement that we're helping, we're trying to help build against U.S. Uh, war and militarism, which we can talk about a little bit later, trying to link up with those people's struggles that are out there, um, you know, small as they may be or large as they may be, um, to be that grassroots voice against militarism uh, coming from, you know, our own country or wherever we may be, um, even if we are small because we are out there, and it is us working together to build this movement, uh, which will eventually talk with us. So I want to end on that. Share a little bit around 
what lessons are there from Bion around how do we build solidarity between different movements? And we were just starting to touch on when we talk between different struggles, but what would be helpful for us to be thinking about here from the really powerful that can happen in that network? Um, so you all get a minute to think. <laughs> you said you want to give us a, a couple minutes. I know there's a ton to say here, but what is most important for us to know to help us bring it? Yeah, really quickly, um, the American invasion of Iraq and the occupation itself was quickly, there was a, uh, you, you know, they, they thought that they were going to be treated as liberators. And very quickly, the Iraqis said, okay, you kicked out Saddam, now get out. Uh, and there was demands for elections right away that the Americans didn't want to have. And they delayed elections a couple of times because they weren't ready to and did not uh, to kind of build the the political apparatus as they saw it fit before uh, 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 before uh, allowing elections to happen. You know, elections and control over elections and the way they happen are itself, I believe, and many times it are it can be can be used as a counterinsurgency mechanism. So just because you have elections doesn't mean you have democracy. It's the way it takes form, when it takes form, and how. So there was resistance from the very first moment. Now, today, I would say there are four different places that you could see resistance occurring and what everyday people are doing to resist. Actually, five different ways. Uh, and I say this with the disclaimer that the history of Iraq since 1958 has been the demise of uh, uh, consecutive governments, particularly the Ba'athist and, and even more so Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, really worked hard to dismantle social organizations that were not uh, incorporated within the state. So different left movements, different uh, liberal movements, different Islamist movements uh, were all undermined pretty and brutally repressed. So, so, so you're working, uh, people are building from scraps in a way. Uh, so the, what you have now in, in, in Iraq is you have a small, very small kind of left movement. So the Communist Party of Iraq, which at a point was one of the largest communist parties in the region, in the Middle East, uh, is still there, but it's very small. And I would say marginal in some senses, but it exists. The second, you have liberal and secular forces um, uh, uh, that are a bit larger, concentrated in some of the major cities, part of the, the and, and, and you see it amongst the intelligentsia and, and so forth. Uh, you also have many nonprofits and civil society organizations that have begun to prop up. Uh, and you know, some of these categories that I'm saying blend into each other, of course. Uh, and these nonprofit uh, and, uh, or civil society NGOs are working hard to organize uh, different communities. Uh, then the fourth are the Islamist forces. And this is why I think it's really important not to clump up everything together. Islamism doesn't really explain anything as a term, but rather uh, obfuscates. So there are various Islamist groups in Iraq that have been at the forefront of resistance against the American invasion. Uh, and at times, have on and, and there is potential for tactical alliances between different groups. So oftentimes the left discards Islamists uh, because sometimes parts of the left is itself guilty of anti-Muslim racism. So I, there is Islamist forces and we can kind of talk about that if there's interest. And the last, there is a social infrastructure for resistance. There's everyday resistance in the way that people live their lives. You know, there is the, the cemeteries that are filled with people who live in those cemeteries, who've made a life in places where life isn't meant to be. There is ways in which people steal electricity uh, and water on an everyday level. This is what the sociologist uh, uh, Asif Bayat talks about as the collective actions of non-collective actors. Where every, every, the, the way that you live on an everyday level is itself, the, your very presence is resistance itself. And so that creates the social milieu, the social infrastructure 
where because of the conditions that you have to live in, there is intimate interdependencies and intimate intimacy between people that then allow itself to, to materialize when uh, 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 something happens that pushes against people and it turns into actual resistance. And so you see, you see ruptures throughout since 2003 of when that's happened. So the, the most recent one has been an ongoing protest movement since August of 2015 in Baghdad and other major cities in Iraq where people every Friday, Islamists and non-Islamists, uh, liberals and leftists go out on the streets and their simple demand is for a government that's competent and it's non-sectarian. And at one point they even took over the parliament. Uh, and so these are the resistance forces that are trying to manage and trying to strategize in a context when there is uh, uh, militaries from regional governments, the United States, intelligences, uh, 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 intelligence services operating and just kind of a, a huge obstacles in their way, but they're there and fighting every single day. So it's another really tiny one. Not very, you know, finite, really superficial questions to it. Um, so how is our ability to organize to end white supremacy in the U.S. strengthened by being anti-imperialist and being functionally internationalist in our way? Well, you know, back in the day, uh, one of the slogans uh, was that we were the majority of people in the world. People of color and oppressed people were the majority. And uh, that was something that infused anti-war and anti-racist and general progressive a tremendous sense of uh, destiny and um, direction. Um, that's still true, but it's harder to concretize to make concrete. So um, the, the struggle, the struggles against empire in the 20th century have always been intertwined with the struggle against global white supremacy. They, they, they've gone together and it's resonated back and forth. So uh, the Pan-African movement, uh, the, the movement uh, in the United States of, uh, the, in, in the late 40s that helped lay the groundwork for the civil rights movement about taking, which the Panthers later picked up on, which was to take the oppression, racist oppression in the United States to the United Nations. Those kinds of struggles that link that um, inspired people. Um, I, two other points. Uh, both, both Yusuf and Rhonda have mentioned the way that uh, people get grouped and how important it is to unclump that. Racism is probably the number one way people get grouped. I mean, you know, in the United States, it's all those dark skinned people, the barbarians are going to come and take over. And the more you can educate people and talk about the diversity of the human race as a positive strength, you're beginning to break down all those stereotypes that justify war. Um, the closest thing in the last period that I think we've seen this in the mass scale was Tahrir Square and the initial response of the United States to the Arab Spring. The, the resonance back and forth between the occupations and the streets in the United States and the occupation in Tahrir Square. And that was a moment when <coughs> anti-Arab racism really took a hit. It really took a hit. And what, what's so painful about the current moment is it's, most people have forgotten it. It's gone. You know, you know, it's been overlaid with all these other things that have happened, wars, terrorism, and so on. And that brings me to the last point I'll make on this. Which, which I think is relevant, although in an indirect sense. We have to work on a number of levels. There's the level of the mass struggle, which is absolutely urgent right now, 
building broad fronts against racism and war, uh, building the broadest possible front against the man-man uh, that we now have uh, in, the, in the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one level. But long range, we also have to rebuild the revolutionary left in mm -hmm. international. Because that, without that kind of direction, no, it's not going to be a reprise of the models of the Cold War era. It's going to be different. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be different. I think the development on the level of the revolutionary left that can give people a sense of how you move from one stage to another stage, that you, the future is embodied in the present. Um, otherwise, you know, without that, the, the revolutionaries, it just sort of hangs. You know, we're for revolution, and there's no real connection between that and the immediate past that we hold. And that is, hurts the immediate struggles, and it really makes, it burns people out. Because we're not going to win in the short time. And Rhonda made the point, we've been fighting in the Philippines since 1898. Uh, we've been, people who have been fighting here since 1620. So it's not going to be over real soon. You need a revolutionary left to embody the future in the present and that can talk about what you can do at this stage to move things to the next stage. Um, so we have to work on both of those levels. Uh, it's very difficult, but I think unless we are uh, somewhat successful on both of those levels, uh, make some headway, I think it's going to be very difficult in terms of the struggle against racism, white supremacy, and imperialism, and all the struggles. And in light of that, <laughs> 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 um, you know, I think for us, we think about staying true to principles while also being flexible on tactics. Um, and as you know, I'm making all talk about international solidarity as a secondary point. But the, the left, and you know, I've been saying that the revolutionary left in the Philippines and the communist left, left in the Philippines, you know, there's still that. Uh, commitment to the armed struggle, to the, you know, waving the struggle and the countryside where the majority of the people are, to the principles of, uh, you know, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, so, you know, and party led. So that's, it still holds true. There's also a really vibrant above ground mass movement, you know, which engages even in um, electoral politics, uh, which has, uh, you know, fought for you know, the peace talks between the revolutionaries and the um, sitting government. So it's not a monolithic <laughs> left. Um, you know, even talked yeah. about tactical alliance with the president of the Philippines while he was still kind of a posturing as an anti-imperialist for things have changed, you know, since in the past year. Um, but the need to, you know, have your principles, know what you're fighting for, stick to the vision for what you have what you want, freedom for the country. Uh, national democracy, <laughs> um, but still have the flexibility in the way you wage that struggle. Um, it's not like it was, you know, maybe uh, 60 years ago when it was really like all the nuns, only, you know, the underground movement, or only the popular national movement. You know, that whole vibrant mix and what it needs to be. Um, and then, you know, solidarity has always been a part of that. Uh, and I think one of the things that um, Zion has been engaging in even more lately is uh, these different formations, both in the region, so in the Asia Pacific with our uh, comrades in Korea, in Japan, even in Taiwan, and other parts around bases specifically, around U.S. militarism in the region specifically, also about food security, um, the way uh, island nations are being affected by global warming, um, the way that nations that are under you know, occupation and war uh, are facing famine. So we're part of these different um, multilateral you know, alliances which work on specific issues. Um, so there's those very concrete projects of solidarity. And then there's, you know, um, you know broader international um, uh, alliances which take on, a, you know, a number of different issues um, which can be, you know, both local issues but seen in that international frame. Um, 
which you know, we talked about a little bit more later if people want to know more, or even that last slide around the Resist U.S. Led War movement is a, uh, an effort to try and build that kind of international solidarity on um, issues. Unfortunately, there was a time conflict that um, the local group uh, Hello organized Bay Area Koreans who were having uh, important event there on time that they were going to try to send some folks here. And I imagine that it is accessible to get a little information from them, probably on the internet or over Facebook. And that'll be a webinar that hopefully is going to have more information for us around how to be in better solidarity with folks around Korea. Um, so let's take a couple questions at a time, and then we'll let the panelists go to town on how you want to respond to those. And since we have a lot of amazing folks in the room, and I know you all have practice at keeping your questions really turned into beautiful, shiny little nuggets. <laughs> it's a good place to keep practicing. So let's take a few at a time. What are you thinking? What do you want to hear more of from the panelists? I'll try to keep it short. I have actually three questions. Um, <laughs> Trump, Trump just tweeted. A, a, a false story about Persian in the Philippines, and I'm wondering what your comments are about this new attack on terrorism, uh, uh, which really was referencing a genocide in the Philippines 100 years ago. Um, to Yosef, you talked about the three different um, sections that evolved into ISIS. I would like you to talk about the three different sections that currently make up the Kurdish people, and that is the Kurdish regional government, which is kind of a capitalist government, and then there's a, 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 a development in uh, Syria called Rojava, which might be an anarchist or communist, I don't really know, and then there's the Kurdistan Workers' Party in Turkey. Can you talk about those uh, three? Uh, countering how you split up ISIS. And then finally for Max, uh, Susan and I just came back from Chicago. We were in Chicago at uh, the Democratic Socialists of America convention where a thousand socialists stood up and sang the international together. You referenced the left and the need for the development of the left. What do you think about this development where this little socialist group went from 6,000 people two years ago to now 25,000 paid up members right now. Let's take a couple more questions. And I want to particularly encourage you if you're someone who doesn't have to ask questions in Q&As like this, and if what you have is even a little fragmented or have to go, that's fine. Put out half a question too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question is about um, how the death of neoliberalism and sort of a heightened moment of critique of global capitalism within this country and around the world can be um, can be capitalized on <laughs> um, because uh, I don't want the fascists to have it. Right? And I think that uh, we're seeing a huge critique of like a globalist, the this, the that, you know, the global elite. The, so corporate culture and corporate critique of corporate culture and global capitalism are high. How can we, in the U.S., shift from this bullshit race war to a class war? Um, and I that sort of speaks to the last question around democratic socialism. You know, how do we turn that and how can that be international? Normalizing and socializing of sort of um, Islamophobic threat to electoral legislation. Um, can you not sorry your hand is well? Oh well, Claire, can you after I, can, after I ask it, can you summarize it for him? Just the just the like normalizing of. Uh, and socializing of our, uh, of like um, people who live here around sort of Islamophobia interacts with 
the global sort of militarizing against Islamic forces. Because I didn't know this until recently, but the countering violence experience, the CVE program now was specifically changed to now like countering Islamic extremism, right? And that that is sort of the shift into what some of what you were talking about, um, and like with the even with the ban, the travel ban. Um, so I'm just curious how that sort of normalizes how people are reacting to when you hear about like is Islamic terrorism, blah, 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 and how that operates under the guise of internationally the wars we're waging. Yes. I think that there's something starting with the, the last quite the last comment about normalizing Islamophobia and CBE. I think that's really key. Uh, and I think it it, it, it the, Anti-Muslim racism f has a m very productive uh, function uh, currently, uh, not only for U.S. war making, but for the state of liberal, the so-called liberal democracies in the West itself. And let me tell you, let me say why. I, the, the, the liberal state with the advent of neoliberalism is no longer able to provide the very services that it provided to the people who it included within it. So liberalism and the liberal state, the West itself, they always included some people and excluded others. It excluded, and, and, and the borders of the West were always, have been always bloody. Whether those are people it colonized and imperialized on outside of its borders or people within it. So within the United States, the First Nations weren't part of the liberal state. Black folks weren't part of the United States. Thus, they were outside of the, thing, the, the, the services that the liberal state was able to give them. Now, it no longer is able to give any of that. The, 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 the way that the economy functions and neoliberalism functions is no longer able to give any of the services that it used to be able to give before. So it's created economic destabilization for all people except for the, the very the top. So the only thing it has left is nostalgia for, liber for, for a time of, of welfareism, uh, of the welfare state that it, it used to have. And all it has left is a security apparatus, a military apparatus that will protect that nostalgia. So it will protect the slogans without those slogans actually being able to be materialized. And for it to be able to then uh, 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 have and material, to, to talk about the, 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 that, that nostalgia and to legitimate that, that, that military and security apparatus, it needs an other, an other that is the antithesis of so-called liberalism. And that has become Muslims. Muslims and the notion of terrorism, which I think we ought to really question the usefulness of the term itself and its applicability and whether it's able to define anything anymore, uh, functions in a very important way for the, uh, for, uh, to, to be able to uh, 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 empower the only thing that, that the liberal state has left, which is the military apparatus to say that we're going to defend against the barbarians. We're going to defend against those who are outside of humanity itself, which are Muslims, which are the Muslim barbarians. And that's why ISIS is so important. And that's why you, the clumping together of ISIS on the one hand to folks fighting in Kashmir on the other hand, to Hezbollah in Lebanon on the one side, to the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, to Abu Sayyaf, all of these groups are clumped under one as the, the Muslim menace, right? And there's a long history in the West. You could take it all back all the way to 1492, 
uh, of, of having the Muslim menace that then defines the, the West itself and then defines the liberal, the, the, liberal, the liberal state. And so when the liberal state is hollowed out of, of everything that it's able to give, the only thing left is the military. And the, and the way that the military reinforces its position is through anti-Muslim racism. So the normalization of anti-Muslim racism in the very discourse is crucial to the state itself and to the sustenance of the state itself. So it's no minor factor. And so in this way, I want to connect that back to the, the, the general Pershing, uh, 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 the tweet that, that Trump posted. You know, I think Rhonda could give us the history of it, but it's a racist comment because the myth is about, oh, he used pig's blood on bullets to kill the, the Moro insurgents in the Philippines. Right? It's racist. And, but the way that you see it talked about in mainstream media is not that it's racist. They critique it for being a myth. Oh, that, it's, that, that he actually didn't say it or it didn't really happen. But it's racist. <laughs> right? That's not part of the conversation. There is a way in which we don't even understand race, even in the moment when everybody's condemning fascism and anti racism and, and, and the racism of Trump. Because when it comes to Muslims, it's not understood as racism. And that's the other crucial factor. Anti-Muslim, the way we, Muslim, when we talk about the notion of Muslims, Muslims aren't, this is not a religious category no longer, it's a racial category. We are seeing a process of racialization where we are now creating the Muslim as a race itself. Uh, so uh, uh, that, and, and um, in terms of the question on, on, on the Kurdish population, uh, the, I think you're, the, the, the speaker was absolutely right that the KRG uh, has unfortunately gone away from its history of, 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 of kind of socialist, leftist, and secular thought to becoming a neoliberal bastion for those who are attempting to, uh, uh, business interests that are attempting to penetrate Iraq. Uh, so that, that is really unfortunate because the, the, the Kurdish region has a long history of struggle. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think you know, what you're seeing in Rojava and PKK are some of the, the still the lingering uh, uh, people who are still doing, doing that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think I can't say more than that about them at this point. Um, and the last thing in terms of the death of neoliberalism, I wonder if we're, see, we're witnessing the death of neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism economically is the transnationalization of production that is going on very well and it hasn't stopped. Uh, what the trend, uh, uh, neoliberalism as an ethos is about seeing yourself as a consumer, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a meta, you see yourself as a business itself. And that ethos now per, permeates all of us. So we all see ourselves as little businesses. Uh, and we, every, the United uh, within the U.S., Americans see themselves as consumers even before citizens or what have you. So that's alive and well in that sense. Uh, and 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 you see the integration of 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 of, of the economy itself and the undermining of political apparatuses in the state. So I think it's it, it hasn't necessarily gone away, and it's a force still to be reckoned with. And we don't necessarily yet have a good answer to it, even though there is resistance movements all over the world. And, you know, my idea my, or, or my philosophy is that it's through resistance that you build the ideology that will then replace the very thing that you're trying to replace. You don't need to have the, the solution. The solution comes within the trenches of the war against uh, neoliberalism or imperialism itself. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Maybe picking up on that last part on the death of neoliberalism, so I think the um, person who asked me was saying that that's actually you know, being touted, but it's not really happening, just like you okay. said. And I think that okay. um, part of what we need to do is actually um, unmask it and show how, like, okay, so Trump is saying no more um, TPP 
CMA right? which is going to enter into bilateral trade agreements with different countries, right? Which also will have all the elements there, probably even more oppressive for uh, people in those countries and then even workers here, right? So I think um, being able to expose those kinds of things um, so that the, the right to have the opportunity to say, oh yeah, look at this great champion um, who is fighting against neoliberalism or like fighting against um, uh, what the same thing that the 99% of the same they want, right? The beast is not. He's just going to entrench it and do it in a different way. Um, and then I think uh, on that point on the normalization of the Islamophobia, it's definitely you know, not even just in this country or not in just in Europe, but you see it alive and well in the Philippines, and that's how you have this whole you know, new um, uh, threats of uh, new U.S. Uh, military operations there under the guise, the guise of uh, fighting uh, Islamic extremists, right? And so um, I think one of the solidarity things that is inspiring there, though, is um, alliance building, coalition building with me to try and not fall into that divide and conquer strategy. Um, there's something called the Moral Christian People's Alliance. There's um, different alliances between like the indigenous people who are also in those same territories as well as um, the moral people, as well as the I believe, Roman Catholic people of the country in different alliances to say we're not falling for it and we're going to try and unite um, people who are people of faith. So I think you know, in this country, definitely a role to play for um, people in the faith sector in uh, helping to, to bridge those kind of divides, um, developing those kind of coalitions against um, the divide tactics, uh, which is, you know, ultimately, I think that's what the um, Islamophobia is and, and rule kind of tactics. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the Trump tweet, you can look at a statement he wrote about it. And it's, it's racist, it's, um, it falls into, uh, again, like uh, building up the argument for why now is there needed, you know, more U.S. military intervention in the country. We weren't able to defeat those barbarians back then or those uh, moral people back then or the Islamic statements of the 1900s. So we should do it now. Raise so the pathway for that. Um, yeah, I think that's a good I think the world's in a very dangerous moment. I think there is a tremendous amount of discontent all over the world with the existing political structures. Um, but the forms that that is taken, taking are not always to our liking. Um, I think there's a tremendous sentiment that the two great projects of the 20th century that promised a better life, liberal capitalism and socialism, people are disillusioned with both. Now, we didn't go through socialism here in the United States, but if you look globally, it's, we have to face up to the fact that there's millions of people out there across the whole what was the Soviet bloc and China who think socialism failed. Ordinary people, not, and I'm talking about ideologues. That is a real sentiment out there. And there's also a tremendous amount of sentiment that the capitalist order has failed. When you have that situation, it's right territory for demagogues, nationalists, chauvinists, all kinds of people like that who are well-funded to jump into those ideological spaces and build reactionary movements. There are some places where that's not as prominent as others. It, like Rhonda said, in the Philippines, there's a left-led resistance. In some places in Latin America, there is. But on a global scale, we're in a good bit of trouble on this. And it will take a while to rebuild the credibility of the left project in many people's eyes. It's a generational thing also. There's the generation that's the most disillusioned and went through that experience will be gone and a new generation comes up. We have an opportunity to create a new model. Now that's not going to happen in some very short time. It's going to take a while. The DSA point, it's tremendous that DSA has grown so rapidly and that there are so many people who are in the United States and around the world moving to the left. But it's not going to turn overnight into a new model of socialism that is going to have credibility with millions and millions of people 
in time for us to stave off the disasters that are staring us right in the face. So, in the United States, for instance, neoliberalism has a lot to bear for the rise of Trump. It's created conditions where so many people are discontent. But the fight right now in the United States, what's happening out there is Trump versus the resistance. It's not neoliberalism versus socialism. And we have to interact with that front. First of all, for that front to succeed, and to see the racist, I mean, this is racist and imperial revenge. People read the polls the last few days. Trump, the political class, and the CEOs are deserting Trump. Republicans are giving him 80% approval. And the majority in the latest poll disapproves of taking down Confederate monuments. So, defeating that reactionary on the, on the level of winning that fight, that's a tough fight right there. Revolutionaries have to be in the midst of that fight and play a leading role in it. That's one way you gain our credibility, by contributing to what millions of people see as the most urgent thing facing them right now. And then we need some kind of intermediate program. It's not going to go from Trumpism to socialism. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my nominee, if you want to toss out an idea, is third reconstruction. What Reverend Barber was from North Carolina. It has a whole bunch of advantages. It's an intermediate program. It taps into American history, and it puts the black freedom movement at the center. So it's a compelling vision that's already out there as a moral and political thing. And the more discussion of the Civil War is on the agenda, the more that resonates with people. As all kinds of people are realizing, hey, Reconstruction, that was a democratic, positive thing with black people in the lead that opened up new democratic options for everyone. That's something people can grab onto, and you can talk about with some roots in American history. It's a lot more concrete for people, and can be made more concrete than socialism right now. That doesn't mean we should stop talking about socialism, but if we're looking at something that's going to be a major platform to fight on right now, I, you know, it's, I think that's a, that's a better choice. And then socialists, we, we need a conversation as we develop that, which is going on within DSA and all the other groups, everybody left the center has grown. So I think we can do that. And then just the last thing, I think the biggest mistake that leftists have made for a long time, and I've made it myself, God knows how many times, is to overestimate our strength relative to the other side and to get live in our own bubble, which in the Bay Area is even easier to do. The same day that Trump was getting hammered for all of the bullshit around Charlottesville, Roy Moore won the Republican primary in Alabama. This is the Ten Commandments guy who's an explicit that the main thing going on in the United States today is discrimination against white Christians. And this guy won the primary, but even though Trump endorsed his opponent. And Bannon was quoted in one of his interviews, or no, it wasn't Bannon, Patrick Buchanan, who was a Nixon speechwriter, was quoted last year saying, if whites in America all voted the way Alabama Doug did, um, the way whites in Alabama do, the, the Republicans will be winning elections for 100 years. So I'm, I'm just saying, let's not, it's great that the left has grown. That's the raw material for moving forward. But we should not overestimate our strength. It is going to be an uphill fight. Not one Republican has resigned. Not one person in the cabinet, in the administration, not one congressperson has done anything. They've issued statements. I'm troubled. 